Jen Champ, I am looking at a book here. It's a humongous uh, notebook, and it uh, says Oral History Research Office Reminiscences of Robert H. Jackson, and it is a typescript of the Columbia Oral History. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the backstory of you getting that? Yes, kind of, I think. Um, we had to it took a few years because I think it was under protected copyright right mm -hmm. for a number of years and then that came uh, uh, came up and uh, we met and we had a conversation about that with with you and I, I believe the director at the time was Jim Johnson and uh, of course John Barrett was involved in that and we wanted a copy for the archives because we had had that ability before. I think there was a copy of it in its entirety at Frewsburg Library Absolutely. But it, and it was given to the library, it must have been by the family at some point in time, but we didn't have a copy. So when it came up that we were able to do that, we had to contact the school and um, put an order and request in and they gave it to us uh, in digital format, came and I was so excited because I had just been, I had gone to Frewsburg Library and read just the chapters that had to do with local history, you know, mm -hmm. Jamestown, Frewsburg, Spring Creek, um, but I hadn't ever read the rest, so it was fantastic. <laughs> and that's where a lot of the content was built on, I think, and I'm sure they still use it, for exhibits and all of the um, information directly coming from Jackson himself, so yeah, I do remember that. It was, it was a process, and I remember the PDFs scan of that was massive. I didn't expect it to be so large. <laughs> so it was. <laughs> and, you said, I mean, I was and, I, and how it came up was yesterday interviewing Mel Feather. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. And Mel's from Frewsburg. And Mel was talking about how he got information to do all the stuff he did at the Robert H. Jackson's elementary school and then at the high school for Jackson mm -hmm. and talked about the Meyer, which then triggered. I said, let me tell you the story. And the story is when I, I knew about this Olympi mm -hmm. Columbia uh, Oral History Project, I knew it would be great to get a copy. And I knew that Harlan Phillips, who mm -hmm. had actually done the interview, had given a copy to Myers. Okay, yeah. I wasn't sure if it was him or maybe Harold Adams or something had something to do with and it, but yeah. So I said, oh, that's a piece, <laughs> that's a piece of cake because I want a copy. Yeah. For This is 2002, yeah. early days. And I went down there, and the librarian said, yes, we have it, and yes, you may look at it, but no, you may not copy it. <laughs> and it was very, mm -hmm. uh, as they should. Mm -hmm. And I learned then that Heart of Phillips it was sort of a gift with restrictions. I even asked Judge Cass, Judge Willard Cass of Frewsburg, to see if he could get an exception. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He couldn't. The librarians he, wouldn't budge. They wouldn't no. budge. Willard Cass, my guy. Yeah. I pulled the string. Yeah. And uh, it didn't work. So uh, that's why I remember when we talked, as you mm -hmm. said, with Jim Johnson. I said, well, it would be great to get a copy. And then all of a sudden, you got it. Yeah. Said, Whoa. Well, I think we just recognized that it was the copyright, or the t l terms of limitation was up yeah. at some point in time. So they were able to give it to us. And it was fantastic. Um, and the whole chapters on Nuremberg and the Supreme Court. Of course, I can't remember, it doesn't cover everything, the Supreme Court, but there's quite a lot on Nuremberg. And, but I also really just loved the history of what he talks about, his family and his yeah. grandparents, his mom, you know, all of those details that you wouldn't get otherwise unless you knew him personally or was able to talk to him. Yeah. So I. <laughs> How did you get into this world of curating and archiving? What, what's your background to get there? Um, well, I went to school for Donia for a degree in English literature, mm -hmm. and then I went to SUNY Albany for a degree in history, because I've always loved history. And at one point in time, I thought maybe I'd teach, and I enjoyed teaching as a adjunct kind of uh, assistant um, a graduate student professor, you know, you, they had those positions that we could teach and then we got paid and took some money off our tuition. I enjoyed that a lot. But um, I started to kind of volunteer at the Albany History Museum. I started to work with some of the historians on projects related to 
archives and collecting and exhibitry, and I really liked that. And then um, when I came back to Jamestown, well, before I came back to Jamestown, I worked at Historic Huguenot Street, which is in New Paltz, New York, mm -hmm. and that's all a, a colonial uh, Huguenot village from the 16th, 1700s, and that was fascinating. And that's kind of where I started to really learn from people in the museum profession how to kind of find what you dig for what you're looking for, overturn every rock you can, and talk to all the people you can, and I joined that with public programs, so I worked it around trying to figure out what the public would like, and, and uh, so I really enjoyed that. And then I came back to Jamestown, I think it was in 2008, and I was here for a few months, and uh, I started a program um, where I was writing, helping writing grants for the Arts Council at that time, which is now the Reg, you know, and uh, they kind of put me in touch with um, Adam Bratton, mm -hmm. who was uh, the president of the Jackson Center, executive director of the Jackson Center, and he called me and uh, asked me if I wanted to work work over there. So that's kind of how I ended up there. <laughs> and uh, I was doing a little bit of everything, but I just loved history. And you know, to be honest with you, before I came back to Jamestown at that time, I wasn't around when the Jackson Center started. And when I was in school, at high school here or in elementary school, I didn't they did not teach about him. Um, so I didn't know much about who he was, but I do remember my grandmother, my, t my um, grandmother who, who died in 2010, she was my inspiration for everything in terms of history because she grew up in Jamestown. She died when she was 100 years old. And uh, she, uh, she remembers her, when I started working at the Jackson Center, she t I told her and she said, oh, Oh, I know Robert Jackson, and of course, she, she was a World War II generation, but it wasn't just that. I mean, she knew about that. Her um, aunt, Miss Viola Swanson, went to school with Jackson at mm. Jamestown High School and talked about him to her, you know? And so it was just a really cool connection. Wow. They lived on Prendergast Avenue. She would go on out. She had all the 1910 yearbook related materials and all the things they wow. did, you know? so. That was really cool seeing all that. I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, so there you are. How did you learn? So again, Anna Braden calls you and he says, mm -hmm. come on over, we got an opportunity for you. What was the state of the archives in at the time in 2008-9? And how did you learn about Jackson? Well, the state, I mean, I, believe me, I've been in all kinds of archives um, and it, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't bad. There was a lot of content you know, and uh, things, I think the thing is, I think the first 10 years you're building content. So you're just going through things and trying to see what you have. and You don't even really know how to put it in any kind of cohesive order at that time because you're still getting, you're new and you're getting all that content. So I was there when you're just starting to build all that. It's coming in, all the stuff that you're finding, people are donating. And I really just learned about him by reading everything that came through as much as I could. and figuring out the people to talk to, you know. Um, I was really interested in learning about his life in Jamestown, and so I just started reaching out to people. People would put me in contact with uh, other historians, people that grew up here. You obviously made a lot of connections with giving interviews with people who aren't here any longer, who knew him. So I just read, watched, listened, and, and found out as much as I could. <laughs> Did you interface with Harold Adams much? He was gone, I think. What, did, what year did he die? I never met him. We never met Harold. Okay. No. Yeah, mm -mm. I'm trying to think when that, when that was. He, he may have passed away when we were on our way to Russia, 2007. Yeah, I, I never met him, but I see he, he had given materials. Yeah, yeah. So those were some of the things that I was looking at. I remember a lot of the things that he had given to the center. Um, and you know there was pictures of him and and Jackson and um, letters, uh, things related to Nuremberg, of course. Um, there was all kinds of um, information about his mom and the family. So I, I I remember learning about him through that, but I never got to meet him. So you again, you're kind of thrown in there, and there is uh, stuff which 
much of which I had gathered as a hunter gatherer. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, literally, as you said, we weren't we didn't want to get it. Yeah. Well, details to follow. We'll sort it out later. Yeah. Details to follow, and we did. Mm -hmm. We were lucky on many fronts, um, including getting videos, mm -hmm. movies from the Holocaust Museum, and mm -hmm. tapes here, and mm -hmm. hair art files mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, how did you even attack? How to organize it? Well. Um, I started first just trying to figure out what people are gonna people are calling about want to know because we're starting to give tours of course they were just developing exhibits at that time too so I just started to kind of organize based on content of his life you know people are interested in Nuremberg there's collections related to Nuremberg and then I if they're interested in things related to his life at Jamestown High School I w would put it into that context, you know, and label it that in these spreadsheets, in massive amounts of spreadsheets, and then, you know, in, in content like that. Because unlike a lot of uh, archives, uh, like library archives and stuff, things are usually donated in collections already, right? You have somebody who died and it's all one big thing. Well, you you were gathering your, like, a, you know, pieces here and pieces there. So I just started looking at time periods of his life. And I think we... We looked at that, you know, from his early life, his, uh, young lawyer, or Jamestown High School, young lawyer, you know, then, you know, the various careers he had going through to official work with the United States government, you know, Supreme Court, Nuremberg, and just trying to see how those, what we could find that would fit into those pieces of his life. His early life uh, captured either in yearbooks or uh, newspaper articles. Um, yeah. Did, did you get work with the public school system at all? Pam Brown, was she part of your world? Yeah. So I remember one of the first conversations I had with um, John Barrett when I met him. He was talking about Mary Willard. And I had, you know, didn't have any idea who Mary Willard was. So that was an idea that was thrown around. We should do an exhibit on Mary Willard and her life and who she was in relation to Jackson. Because she, he, Everybody, if you go to their Jackson Center website, you can see the um, memorial that Jackson gave to Mary Willard at Euclid Street School when she died in 1931. You have to, I got to go back and look at that date, but it's somewhere around that time. And uh, it's a most wonderful speech. I mean, he, he, he just could write, and, and, but that you could really feel the just admiration and love that he had for this teacher. And I just thought, wow, you're right. You know, we should really do something about that. And so that was one of the first exhibits that I did was on Mary Willard. So I connected with Pam Brown, who was the archivist for the Jamestown Public Schools. And if you've never been to the public school archives, it's, it's there's a lot. <laughs> you know, they have to keep track of all the student records, but on top of that, they have historical records. And so she and I just poured through every single box they had there related to the time period that Mary Willard would have been a teacher from the uh, late 1800s through when she retired in 1917 or something like that, 1916. Um, and even, then even later. Um, and we found so much that was uh, just wonderful about who she was as a teacher, her relationship with her students, her work um, founding the Avon Club, which is a Shakespeare club for young women. Um, and then you know, the things that, and Jackson even mentions that in his speech, you know, she had this knowledge of Shakespeare that was incredible. Well, that, that was, you know, he really, I think I remember tying that to some of the speeches that he gave where he quotes Shakespeare at the beginning or in somewhere in his work, he's quoting Shakespeare and you know that came from her. He's remembering that, you know. So it was, you could just see a piece of that, and I just loved that so much. And then we w we went to the Fenton, and we found the Fenton has the one. Well, we found more pictures that we realized later, but they had the one picture that you see of her now, which is at the Jackson Center. And I talked to Karen Livesey, who were, was the archivist at the Fenton, and she and Norm um, Carlson helped me find more content. And so it just grew from there. And I just that was my a favorite project of mine ever. <laughs> well, and, and I think it, it replicated itself fairly not that long ago, or at least we maintained it uh, before we did the renovation for teachers, you know, yeah. to come and who's your favorite teacher and there's yeah. that, that story 
board that you you put up. Uh, were you involved in the timeline uh, that was put up in the uh, four year of that? Was, was that was that your project? Well, it wasn't just mine. I was involved in it because I helped. And and James, do you remember James O'Brien? I do. Who who passed away? Which he was just a fantastic guy. Um, so I met him, and he was the designer of it. But what I did is I worked with him to get the content he needed, um, write some of the content. He did, he did some of that as well. But mostly photographs, um, uh, research requests that he needed. And then he laid out the design files. And, and, I, and I learned a lot from him on that because I didn't go to school for any kind of graphic design, and he did. He was, that's what he did. So um, I really learned a lot from him on how to, how to do some of that storyboard paneling. And, um, and he's the one that put that together and we unveiled that. I can't remember what year it was, a, few, a couple years after I started, maybe 2010, I'm not really sure. And then we put it into a little booklet as well. So that was a great project and I really miss him. He was a, he was a great guy. And when he, I think when he died, he actually gave us um, donate a scholarship to small history museums he loved history so much and and so that was a good project to work on so you you worked on many other projects as mm -hmm. well you, can you can you highlight a few others um well i did a whole exhibit on nuremberg mm -hmm. which um detailed uh the various parts of the content that we had in the collection related to nuremberg um there was a lot of material that had come from various people, um, so we put that together. Um, I can't remember what year that was unveiled, but it was somewhere around an anniversary. So, it so it an anniversary. <laughs> yes, 19, maybe the 70th, or I don't remember. <laughs> but um, we did an exhibit on Nuremberg. Uh, I, I was there when the Chief Justice came, Chief Justice John Roberts, mm -hmm. and so that was very important because we had to get everything in tip-top shape for that. So we borrowed content, we created new signage, We put out material that hadn't ever been on display before um, or hadn't been on display in a long time, including Jackson's Nuremberg suit and hats and all kinds of things that he had on at the Fenton. Um, the Fenton had a lot of this content because, of course, the Jackson Center wasn't established at the time. And I think that suit and clothing and pens and uh, letters were donated to the Fenton by his daughter, by Jackson's daughter. So we were able to borrow that and put an exhibit together for when uh, the Chief Justice came. Um, I was really involved in the movie and getting the movie, uh, the people that were creating the movie, editing it, and producing it, the getting Gensimers. the Gensimers. The Gensimers, yes. <laughs> um, I worked closely with them to get it, whatever content they needed. So. Um, I, I put them in touch with people or gave them the content, you know, photographs, documents, scans of whatever they needed. Um, and then I, I really helped with that project. And then uh, we redid the website. So we updated that and I added all, all the content, you know, in terms of or archival or collection materials and then just in general trying to do as much as we could, we could with the website. I also worked closely with the teacher program that Joe Carb and um, Drew Bider, Drew Bider I think I'm <laughs> uh, ran, and that was wonderful. They uh, meet I every summer, and I think the teachers would come and they would have sort of different projects, and I would work with them on all the projects and 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 host them at the center, give them tours, take them around Jamestown, um, and it'd be a part of that process. Uh, the Janowski, book. Janowski had a project. Oh yes, that's right. Oh, the World War II. Um, the, the, uh, what was it? The Nuremberg Prisoners. Yes, we something had that. Stories from the cell block. Yes, yeah, story from the cell block. So those were the Nuremberg prisoner notes that he yeah. had had. So we put that on. But his big one um, that he did was the a hometown during war, which came from oh, a, yeah. hometown goes to war. You know Raleigh's book. And so then he was so inspired by that, you know, book that he started, he really wanted to do something about a hometown during war. Remember the, he had um, the wedding dress, yeah. uh, which the center still has, I'm sure, because he donated it to them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and who, oh, who was that? It was the, 
the people that own the um, insurance business, their father. Oh. Johansson. Yes. And they came and they told me this story of his dad. I think it was his father, right? And his mother in this wedding dress that was made from a parachute. Mm -hmm. That was the inspiration for that whole exhibit. And the best thing about that was is that we put out a, a call to the public and we said, we want to do this exhibit about hometown during war. And we got hundreds, and I would say at least four, three, four hundred different people that came forward from all over Chautauqua County that brought materials in, that told stories about their families. Um, and it was just wonderful. Yeah, yeah I, that was a great, that was a great uh, exhibit as well, we did, so. Were you involved with Gail Jarrow? No, she was done with her book, um, but that book really helped with the timeline that uh, J James O'Brien and I worked on. Um, and of course that was instrumental in all the, when Joe and Drew were getting the teacher work together. So I, I read the book many times. <laughs> well, we distributed, so, I was just telling yeah. the story, over 10,000 of these books. Yeah, yeah. That, I did have help El Helen Eversaw. Yes. Um, so she, well, uh, off the pedestal, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I helped her with her book. Um, Megan, actually Megan Sorensen and I helped her with that when Megan was there. And um, and then I j when I was just leaving with Kat when Kathy Crocker was doing her book. So I think I was, she was just starting it and I was just leaving. So I did, I did help her a little bit and I saw her after that a, a few times, but um, I wasn't there for the end of that. But yeah, I did help her with that a little bit. Were you involved with Megan and the exhibitry up at the Buffalo Courthouse? Oh yeah, yeah, we did that. Um, Megan organized it and got that together. I was there when it was named and uh, was excited to be a part of that. And I haven't been back since, I can't, I, but I remember the windows with all the etchings, so they're beautiful. And um, we did we did an exhibit out up there, and then it actually stayed moved. It was on the first floor when we were having the dedication, and then it moved up to library. Library, yep. So I remember that. Yes. A great memory. <laughs> um, uh, so you you were there, um, and and of course along the way we did such exhibits on Korematsu. I did, yeah, I did that first one. Then they yeah. redid that. Yep. But we did the first one because I met his, I was there when the, I think she's been there a number of times, yeah. but I was there at least once when she was, when she came. And, um, and we had photographs uh, for that exhibit. And um, uh, I think that was one of the last ones I did, actually. I can't remember what, because I was, I left in 2016. So it was, well, 2000, yeah, 2016. So can't remember if there's anything else. So you were there for you know eight years or more and did you ever get a chance to see meet and get to work with any of the program speakers that we had come through that time period? Oh. Any of those people? Um, well I, I, I met them all because I was for I was at a lot of the events. Um, I, I kind of I, I, I think I think actually Karen Korematsu was one of the most fascinating people I got to talk to, you know, but I think my favorite was uh, Father Fuchs. <laughs> I, I, just, I just really respected him. He was just an amazing man. And I, he also just had a way of making you feel comfortable. You wanted to talk to him. He didn't, you know, I, I was uh, pregnant with my first child when I first met him and he's just so excited about that he was you know wanted to bless me and, and the baby and uh, I talked to him I sat at his table at that luncheon I think it was at the courthouse that mm -hmm. at that time and uh, that was that was a great person to meet um, so I was excited about that when he passed away he uh, left us archives that were related to Jackson. Oh, that's great. Little did we know in the archives when uh, they were delivered, well actually I went to Fulton to get them, and was, uh, and you have to see this because you're going nuts, <laughs> uh, is the indictment oh. autographed by Jackson to him. That's wonderful. The yeah. opening statement mm -hmm. autographed and the closing statement autographed, all three by Jackson to him. 
Oh, that's like, that's so great. Well, it was interesting. I got a letter at my house. No, I got a letter at the Fenton from the woman who, who was his caregiver. Mm -hmm. And it had a clipping where I was in the picture. Oh, right. And she sent it to me when he died. Yeah, wow. And then what a little note about how uh, he remembered me. And you know, it was just, it was that, anyways, that's the kind of person he was. I think he so. was and she was Barbara. yeah Barbara, she, she stays she, in touch with oh us. good yeah and we hope in a perfect world all that gets displayed around December 14th oh that's sort of good just <laughs> unload everything we've done mm -hmm. of, of, of note uh, including any in, in of the publications do you remember were you involved in any of particular publications booklets I know you work with Helen Ebersol off the mm -hmm. pedestal were there other books at the time that were kind of floating through um, most of the ones that you had published in relation, like you know, like the the one of Jackson speaking at the Swedish, yeah, those, those were already done, yeah. um, but we gave them out a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can't remember if there was any that we did. Henry I, King, did we do any of his things? We did do uh, a, one booklet on on some on him. Yes, yeah. it wasn't very big though. I think no. it was just like a newsletter type of uh, yeah. thing. Um, but that's all I can remember on that. Yeah, Henry King donated his that was one of the first projects we had thankfully I had three interns that summer and actually Noah Goodling who runs the Fenton now was one of them no kidding he he um he was the intern there that helped process the Henry King paper because it was you remember that uh, I do. I <laughs> it was did you go with us down to Cleveland no I didn't but I was there when it came back <laughs> Holy God. and uh I didn't know what to do and uh, Adam Adam was he just said okay here you go do what you can <laughs> I said I've never done anything so we had to go through all of that and you know obviously you know assess it and, and decide what you're gonna keep and discard and, and just all of that and it was helpful with having those interns three of them that worked on it that summer for three months okay mm -hmm. well just for the camera because I think it is important to know miss uh, Henry King we got to know him early on in 2001 through a relationship he had with Marty Coyle uh, at SKF. Okay. Or, yeah, uh, no, TRW, TRW. And um, Henry was general counsel and Marty was general counsel. It was a relation. So that led to him coming here several times to speak. Uh, really enjoyed it and he came to Warren, he came to Chautauqua, mm -hmm. he came here. And through that time I asked him what he was going to do with his archives. And he said, well, I'll give it to you and make sure that he, he mm -hmm. actually changed his will so we got it to the chagrin of case western by the way oh <laughs> yeah. michael sharp uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyways then so he passes away and this is the this is the interesting part his daughter suzanne wagner i believe called and said come get it i will be there at the house at such and such a time mm -hmm. and it was like one day notice yeah <laughs> so we literally hired a uh uh, Hertz van, or not more than a van, a truck, and went down there and just loaded it with books mm -hmm. and papers mm -hmm. and stuff, yeah. and tapes. <laughs> yeah, and she was there, so we knew she knew exactly what we were mm -hmm. taking. But it was massive, and I had to have, I think, two or three people come with me, and one had to drive in a car. And so many I had to have helpers, yeah, horses to lug <laughs> all that stuff. And yeah, then it came back, and of course we had to unload it. They yeah. had to sort it out. And it went up in the library, which is named after him, right? Yeah. Right. And now here's a here's a quick quiz. I don't uh, uh -oh. see if you remember this, because I don't. But at the time, there was a, a recently retired uh, librarian at JCC, and he offered up his services as a volunteer to do something at the Jackson Center, and we just gotten the books. Mm -hmm. And so he spent hours and hours upstairs putting those library mm -hmm. tags and numbers mm -hmm. on all of them. And I could visualize them, and then he left. Uh, but he did a great job. And I, do you? Dennis something, I think. I can't, I, you know what? I just, can, I just saw him on Facebook a little bit ago. Did you really? Yeah, so I think I can figure out who he is again, because I cannot remember. But I know that I saw connected somewhere through Facebook through JCC and somebody else, it might have been um, somebody I was working with down there. This was within the last year. Yeah. And I connected, I didn't connect with him, but I, I found him on Facebook. Yeah. 
see, so he took the first, because librarian work is, is it's not easy. <laughs> I mean, that's like processing. He did that first, so he entered all of that and passed perfect. Yes, and exactly. yeah, he did all of that. Um, that was fantastic. And he'd work on weekends, and I forget yeah. he was either. He was a really nice guy, yeah. 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 Um, but I'll see if I can find him because that would be nice to find him. That was yeah. a flash. He was so helpful for us because we, we had to sort out. We didn't know what we were doing. I didn't have any idea about book, about yeah. the about what to do with a library. Yeah. I mean, I worked in public programs for, you know, history. I could, I could deal with some archival content, you know, exhibits, but I was like, oh, I have nowhere idea where to start with a library. That's a whole other thing. <laughs> so he yeah, really he, helped. He did. And anyways, that, that, that we, that's a, somewhat of a side. Uh, what other memories do you have? Like, you know, we would keep bringing stuff in or finding stuff. Mm -hmm. It could be Holocaust Museum. It could have been, the, at one point we got all of the, uh, in a digital format, the uh, uh, archives from, or the digital format from the Library of Congress, mm -hmm. yep. as well as the Spielberg Movies. The movies, yeah, the microfilm. Yes, and you yeah. were in the middle of all that, you know, yeah. kind of helping yep. orchestrate that. It was fun looking through the microfilm and working on microfilm machine. I, I wonder if you have, do you have an updated microfilm over, do you still have the microfilm over there? I, I, I don't know. I don't microfilm know. is difficult, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember. But then you got it digitized. Yeah, we did. Yeah. And that was, yeah, that was, but then it was still numbered. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, still, you still had to go in and it was. <laughs> I, I have a copy of it. It's, 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 it drives you mad. It does. It's in, and, and, and now there's better programs for searching microfilm and, or making it searchable more. I mean, they did, we did the best we could with what we had, but um, I, I, I guess I uh, remember, you know, just, I liked the, I really liked the interviews you did with the people that knew him could talk about him. I loved those and and um and when 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 a rare thing would come like I remember there was a, a 1910 yearbook that somebody gave that had, you know, two I can't remember somebody had grandfather or something had 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 it and it was it had him in there and it was one of his lice um his debate team buddies yeah. and they had it inscribed. Yeah. You know, I mean that kind of stuff is really was really I loved that. And I loved the uh, books that came from, I never really quite understood the history of where the books came from, but I feel like they might have been at his house in, La uh, on, on, in Lakewood. And, and they were part of that library. So then we started going through, I think they were just in boxes, right? And you just couldn't, nobody had had time at the time to go through them. So I started to do that and you started finding like little notes in the margins and uh, like pieces of paper, and that was that was fantastic because you just felt like oh here he, I mean I'm sure this isn't a romanticized version of this, but I just imagined him closing the book, putting it on the shelf, and then I open it, you know, sixty some years later or whatever, and it's there. I just that was really cool. I like that. Well, there you go. He, he touched it. He touched <laughs> it. I get it. I, I get that magic. Uh, yeah, all of that was fascinating, and I for, I had forgotten about that, but. The owner of the uh, property when he sold it to Tom Stafford mm -hmm. had kept the library and called me and, and made it available. Yeah. And I'm drawing a complete blank as to who that was. And it, uh, but anyways, that, that's how that happened. Yeah. Uh, and we also worked through the law firm of Wright, Wright and Hampton, and they had some files on Jackson that we were able to get. And of right. course, the variety of files that we got from former Nuremberg prosecutors mm -hmm. who were part of Jackson's team yes. who would come through the Jackson Center, and right. I always ask. Yeah, you know, do you have? You got stuff? <laughs> eh, maybe, I don't know. And mm -hmm. then he'd pass away, and in would come three or four boxes. Right. Of, and that, I, I can't even remember all of that, but I do, I do know when we put the Nuremberg exhibit together, I was very surprised at the different donors and the people that the things that you had yeah. so that was you really got to see some really cool things with that yeah I think you know also just working with I, I loved working with Carol and still see Carol a lot so that's good um, I still remember the law dialogues was intimately a part of it was a small team that ran that when it first started <laughs> up mm -hmm. until like just recently right mm -hmm. so 
I remember just helping Carol like at 1.30 in the morning trying to move stuff from the Anthonyum to her car or wherever you had to or David used to pick people up in Buffalo all the time and bring them back and forth. You know, we drive people wherever they needed to go into the wee hours of the morning. So that was, that was uh, interesting. And that's the first time I ever met Jim, you know, before he became the um, uh, director, the president. And, uh, and I still see Jim and Pam's, sure. you know, so yeah, that was, that was good. That is the common denominator with all the people I've interviewed. They've all were under the long arm of Carol Drake. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everybody, yeah. everybody, yeah. Exactly. Cole, Anita Sanctuary. I gotta say, I learned a lot from Carol because Carol knew how to, she knew how to make um, people feel go good about being there and yeah. wanting to be there, you know? And it was like a home, you know, you're welcomed, you wanted to come in the door, you, you, you were always treated with first class uh, service and um, a smile no matter who you were. And, um, and I just, I learned a lot from how to, how to treat people from mm -hmm. Carol. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, and in terms of in a work environment, you know, yeah. so that was, that was good. <laughs> Did you ever uh, uh, observe Steve Massa in action doing his perpetrators? Uh, just, you know, he, that was just, Clayton oh yeah, Bennett. yeah. I didn't interrupt Steve. No, no. I, did, <laughs> I sat back and let him do what he knew best, right? right. And uh, and he loved the the um, notes from the cell block exhibit. Yeah. He really he could really take that to levels I didn't even go at. Yeah, go to you know because his research on on the on the defendants and and their various crimes and the things that they had done and so on. He, he knew that, you know, like the back of his hand. So I do remember remember that, yeah. We wrote, he actually wrote a book, Gathering Up I remember that, together. yeah, I remember that, yeah. That was towards, the, I don't remember when it was published, but I do remember that, yep. Well, one of the things that we are gonna do, because I interviewed Steve, mm -hmm. I said, Steve, you need, to do, you need to do the tour one more time. Yeah, tape it. <laughs> and I wanna tape it, and at the same time, we'll, call everybody together just to have lunch. Yeah. Have lunch and you're the program. That's nice. And so we're going to do that sooner rather than later because he's willing to do it. Okay. Okay. That would be fun. Just that would be good. Yeah. So stay tuned. Yeah. Stay tuned and all of that stuff. So uh, what, what's the question as you're walking down from the Prendergast Library and <laughs> you're wondering, I wonder if Greg's going to ask me this question. What is that question that uh, I should be asking you? I thought you were going to ask me the uh, Jeopardy question that you ask everybody, <laughs> which I can't even remember now. So that's why I was walking down here trying to remember what that was. And, and I couldn't, and I, I said, I sat and heard that many times, and I can't remember what it is. So you gotta, you got to tell me again. Cause <laughs> Well, did you ever get a call from Jeffrey? I forget who got the call. I, did, I did get a call from the woman who covers the Supreme Court for NPR. Okay, yeah, uh, Nina Totoro. Yes, that was fantastic. Yeah. And then I put her in touch with who she needed to talk to. But it was, it was. I remember when I answered the phone and she said, ah, this is Nina Totenberg. And I said, oh my, yeah, that was, that was cool. But anyways, no, I did not get the Jeopardy call, no. <laughs> it, it, it was, the, and here's the serendipity on that, the final Jeopardy question was, uh, <laughs> name the only person in the history of the United States who was a Solicitor General, Attorney General, and a justice of the okay. Supreme Court. Yes. The final Jeopardy question. <laughs> who was Robert H. Jackson? Well, here's the postscript. You know, you just mentioned Drew Bider and uh, Joe Carver, and they were involved. They were involved in the National History piece, and we were, for a period of time, we actually gave out the Robert H. Jackson Award to the top history mm -hmm. teacher. And they invited me to go to Washington to meet what they do, just to show what they did, and to have lunch or dinner with all the hotshots there, which I did. And uh, there they introduced me to a guy named Steve, and I forget the last name, who was in fact the Jeopardy person who got that oh, answer. <laughs> that's amazing. You yeah. can't make this stuff no. up. So of course, sit down. Yeah. I got to interview you. <laughs> How did you even know about Jack? All that, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. So. Uh, yeah, yeah that, that Jeopardy question, I've used that. I know. <laughs> that's 
that's fine. But, <laughs> now but, I remember. <laughs> but somehow, uh, I think Carol got the call. It was, it was a couple times Jackson has been the answer. Right. Uh, yeah. To some things, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, did you provide any information to, I'm thinking Biter and Carb now, they work very hard with the New York State Regents mm -hmm. to get Jackson in as a required teaching subject. I think Jackson's opening statement mm -hmm. is in the, in the, in the curriculum. Is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. did, did you provide any background material to that? I gave them, yeah. So they, they needed uh, just, you know, the documentation, anything that, that we needed from the archives, the um, questions they had, I provided whatever they needed. Of course, they did the work to get it, you know, to where it was, um, but I did help them with that. And I remember that, and, and I remember when that changed, they were trying to, you know, when this, the curriculum started changing in New York State, and Common Core and all of that, it was a chance to really uh, you integrate him, him into that. And like I mentioned before, when I was in school, we we didn't. So that was that was a great step. For that was a big step, and that, mm -hmm. that was really Joe worked very hard at Joe. Mm -hmm. um, you also did some road shows for us. I mean, you were you were uh, did some stuff for the state and archives and a variety of things that you even got me into. Uh, <laughs> do you remember some of that travels? <sighs> no. <laughs> like where did I go? Um, did you ever go to you know, Albany? Did you ever go there? Uh, uh, did I go to Albany? Buff I know we went to Buffalo. We went to Buffalo a couple times. Yeah. I went around the county a lot. Yeah. Um, I went to Warren schools, uh, Warren County. Um, we went to Erie. Um, I I, I I don't think I did go to Albany. I, I did we did we did stuff in Buffalo. I did go to Rochester. I think that's about as far as I went in terms of talking about Jackson and working. But because I went to a number of conferences related to education that Drew and Joe they had organized in Buffalo yeah. and various areas out there. So I did represent the Jackson Center at those. And there was a lady from the New York State Library uh, who was helpful in getting us toward at least looking at grants. And she came down here a couple times, mm -hmm. and, and I drawn a big blanket. Oh, yeah, me too. Um, She's a big deal, but very, very supportive. Of yeah, us. I remember, and I, I think that was the beginning of. Well, I'm not sure if any grants got written through that program. I know that we did receive. I wrote a number of grants for the education program, yeah. and I wrote the grant that funded the rest of the movie, which was a local grant. You remember yeah, that. Yeah. Um, and getting that to to go through, of course, you have to think all of the exhibits were done well through grants. Right. We, uh, yeah. Community Foundation, Lene Foundation, uh, Sheldon Foundation all gave money for for making those possible. We, I wrote a lot of those grants. Um, I think even updating the website. You know, you you do what you have to in nonprofit world. You write those grants and and get them out there and see what you can do with it. Uh, so. I did a lot of that for for the programs and for for the archives and exhibits and stuff. Have so. you been back over since the new renovation? I have not. I was there. I was very interested before everything shut down. I stopped over because I really wanted to see if there was any evidence of where the kitchen, what the building looked like. Because I'm fascinated with the history of of the Kent family and all of that mm -hmm. as well. Um, so I did see it in mid-renovation, but I haven't seen it now. So I have to go back over and see. Yeah. And did you get Janet Northrop's book? Uh, she did a book on I the building. I ha I, she came to the Fenton when, I was okay, when she good. was doing that. So I met her. Yep. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. and that was totally her initiative. I, I yeah, she did. Yeah, it's interesting. The Kent, Alonzo Kent was a, a known, I mean, I know you have the Underground Railroad. <laughs> Stay with the story. <laughs> <laughs> but I will just emphasize this part, which I know to be true. Uh, <laughs> anyways, Alonzo Kent was an, uh, a, benefic a beneficiary of the abolitionist yeah. movement. I mean, he gave money. We, yeah. That is at least somewhat documented in, in, in things, newspapers and some other materials and things like that. So it's, that's interesting to me, yeah. Well, I, and just again for the camera, just so mm -hmm. we, we know the story. It was sort of urban legend about the whole Underground River. Right. And the building was built in 1858, so mm -hmm. it is time-wise mm -hmm. put possible. And, of course, the evidence of in the basement mm -hmm. of that arch on the floor yeah. and the digging. Clearly where there was something going on there. But there was a cardboard piece. When we bought it in uh, 2001, mm -hmm. 
as you entered that room, it just said Underground Railroad circa 1858. Oh, it was just cardboard, huh. you know, kind of nailed there. Nailed there. Hmm. So uh, it's it's it makes for a great story, and uh, I don't I don't invite our friends from Fenton to come up and try to do. <laughs> Try to debunk it. <laughs> no, don't, don't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, stick with the story. Yeah. Well, the building is. It, it was, and you know, uh, Alonzo Kent was a contemporary of uh, Governor Fenton, and of course, the whole story of President Grant. And I mean, it's it's a, it's got a lot of history, and it's a really cool house. That is true. That's a story. That is definitely true. true. Yes. And Paul Leon has not only <laughs> talked about it, written about it. We've found all kinds of evidence, and uh, it, it's it's been fascinating. Well, and you know Jackson was, and then the Masons. Yep. And he and I always loved the fact that he was a Mason and was in that building, you know, and sat in that auditorium, and you have the photo to prove that. So yeah, that is that's a good thing. Yeah. We were lucky to grab all that stuff when we did, while mm -hmm. people were still among us. Uh, you know, you you added so much value to the Jackson Center. Do you do you pause and reflect on that time that you were there? Oh yeah, sure. I I, I follow. Well, first of all, I follow a lot of what you're doing now. I mean, the online programming, and um, I try to connect that to. I try to tell people about what's happening. I read John's Barrett's. Um, you know. Um, newsletter and articles. And you're that still he, a resource for him. I guess I am occasionally. Yeah, <laughs> he does. Or I ask him questions. Um, yeah, and uh, I, I I look forward to going back to the building and, and seeing the, the updates. And I, I obviously have a deep appreciation and respect and love for Jackson. And I wish I could have met him. Really? <laughs> well, you, you, you virtually met him probably I guess as so. close as anybody. Yeah. yeah, so I'll have to show you the, well, I think I did send you the, do you remember the, the it was about a year ago, the press club photo mm -hmm. that I found in the archives at the Fenton? And it has, and John, we went back and forth a little bit, and he said he didn't think it was Jackson sitting in the picture, but then then he said, "It has to be him because it couldn't be anybody else." Oh, really? And it's a young. He's like 21, oh my 22, and he's sitting in the press club. And 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 in the picture is all of his m mentors from Jamestown. You know, all the people yeah. that he uh, that he he worked with. And I'll, I'll, you have to see that again. If you don't if you don't find it in your emails, going back, let me know because I'll have to send it to you. Um, because he sit, he's, he's sitting there. And John, he did say, it has, I'm not sure, but I think reason says it has to be him because he was definitely there that night. Well, that, that's a good sign because John, <laughs> John could be the, the ultimate skeptic about those things. He's yeah. a good, good historian, you know. Yeah. Start with it's not him until it's two, proof, two it proofs. So I sent him back a bunch of things that said that I found, and he knew, of course, what the history was of it. but. Yeah, I was excited to find that. It's a oh. press club, Jamestown Press Club, 19, 1914, I think. 19, pretty sure. Okay. Yeah. Did, uh, does the Prendergast have anything dealing with Nuremberg? I know at one point they had a set, this is a long time ago, of the trial transcripts. Do they still have that or did they give those away? N no, the, the set is still in the back stacks. Okay. Uh, they're, they're not out. For the public, but you can get them if you okay, request them. Okay. Um, and uh, and of course, there's there's other books they're, they're related to to Robert Jackson and, and um, local history books and things like that. A lot of the archival content that the Prendergast had was uh, deaccession and give to the given to the Fenton at some point in time many years ago. Um, but they still have those, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just remember seeing that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now the picture you do have to send me. Okay. Here's the picture you have to send me because when you okay. did Frank the, Mott was in it. I remember all these, and that the the Bendine, the yeah. Bendine, um, and and the and the eccentric. I still Norm Carlson wrote about him, and I cannot remember his name, but I'm going to find out. That eccentric kind of traveler, uh, kind of bard that. Uh, Kind of traveled around. I remember Jackson used to talk with him and meet with him, and he 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 didn't really have a home, but he wasn't necessarily homeless. 
Hmm. And he's he's buried at Lakeview Cemetery. Like they put up a monument to him. Okay. Gosh, you got it. But anyways, he's in that picture too. Uh, now you now you got my. <laughs> <laughs> I I'll have to find it. I sent it to you, and I, I know John was on that yeah, email, yeah. too. Okay. Well, thank you. This has been fantastic. Okay. Right? You have been wonderful. <laughs> Your dad would be so proud. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>